Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, today's topic is one that is of interest and also horrifying to me on a number of different levels. Um, and it has to do with the opiate epidemic, which has broader implications for healthcare. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Chris McGreal, let's start with this, the author of a marvelous book called American Overdose, delivered what I think was a riveting talk on the opiate epidemic at our conference a few weeks ago. And by the way, if you were not able to attend, we videotaped everything. You can have access to the video platform by calling our office or emailing me at pampopper at msn.com. Um, but anyway, Chris McGreal continues to follow and write about developments in the opiate crisis as they unfold. And one of the main areas to watch right now is hundreds of lawsuits which have been filed all over the United States. And um, the drug companies are being forced to pay out huge settlements as part of taking responsibility for their role in causing one of the worst episodes in the history of public health. McGreal has been rightly critical of drug companies and the distributors, which demonstrated what I think anybody would believe, uh, particularly after what I'm gonna tell you today, was wanton disregard for human life in their quest for profits. Yet the drug companies seem to think that the criticism is not warranted. In a recent article, Chris reports receiving communications from both a public relations firm and a law firm representing various branches of the Sackler family demanding that he withdraw a claim in a previous article that Purdue Pharma helped to create a disaster that has so far resulted in the deaths of over 400,000 people. The letters ignore the mountain of evidence showing that the Sacklers, who are at one time very well-respected billionaires famous for their philanthropy and the toast of the town, were really no better than common drug dealers. In fact, in 2007, Purdue Pharma entered a guilty plea for the criminal offense of misrepresentation in an advertising campaign that claimed that OxyContin was less addictive and more effective than other opioids. Additionally, the President's Commission on Combating Drug and Addi Addiction and the Opioid Crisis concluded that Purdue's marketing program and the company's investment of billions of dollars, literally, and influencing government regulation and medical policy resulted in a tenfold increase in the prescribing of opiate drugs. To be fair, Purdue did not do this alone. According to Bertha Madras of Harvard Medical School, the principal author of the commission's report, the drug companies who marketed and made and marketed these products uh, collectively invested enormous amounts of money that literally bought off, and she tells McGreal in his article that she does not use this phrase lightly, bought off the Joint Commission, which accredits hospitals and sets medical policy, the Federation of State Medical Boards, um, several American pain associations, and the legislature by investing almost two and a half billion in both lobbying and funding members of Congress. In fact, right now, and it's been this way for a long time, there are more drug lobbyists than elected members of Congress, which allowed the companies to successfully block the efforts of a few members of Congress who were responsible, understood that there was a real problem and they were trying to pass laws to mitigate some of the damage. Um, they even controlled uh, physician training and the development of guidelines for treating pain. And for fact, the drug companies corrupted the very institutions that should have been protecting Americans from them, converting them from regulators to business partners. The investment paid off. By 2012, American doctors were writing uh, over 255 million prescriptions per year for opiate drugs. McGreal's meticulous research shows that the drug companies were very well aware of the negative impact of their products and actively pursued strategies to expand the market for products that they knew were dangerous. For example, Johnson & Johnson hired the prestigious consulting firm, and prestigious might have air quotes around it based on what I'm going to tell you, McKinsey & Company to help increase sales. McKinsey recommended targeting doctors who were already prescribing large amounts of OxyContin and also advised the drug maker to target high abuse risk patients. This sounds more like conversations that would happen between members of a drug cartel than what you would expect from strategy sessions involving American business executives. McKinsey also served as a consultant to Purdue advising both Purdue and Johnson & Johnson to invent an epidemic of untreated pain which would increase demand for their products. And, and so one of the reasons I think this is important to point out is that this wasn't one of these things where the drug companies thought they were doing a good thing and then it backfired and gosh, if only we'd known. They knew exactly what they were doing and they did it anyway. 
Makers of opiates funded what appeared to be an independent organization called the American Pain Society, or APS, which promoted the idea that pain relief with opiates was actually a human right. APS was responsible for convincing the Veterans Administration and the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations to recognize pain as the fifth vital sign along with markers like blood pressure and temperature and to prioritize the treatment of pain with opiates. According to a lawsuit filed by several municipalities in West Virginia against the Joint Commission, the Commission partnered with Purdue Pharma and other opioid makers to issue pain management standards that misrepresented the risk of opiate addiction and resulted in inappropriate prescribing of the drugs. The lawsuit alleges that the Commission continued this partnership even after Purdue had pleaded guilty to felony criminal charges, as I stated earlier, for misrepresentation concerning OxyContin. And that should have been a clear message to the Commission to change the rules of the game. According to McGreal, Purdue wrote and distributed educational materials, if you could call it that, for free for the Commission in return for opportunities to interact with and train medical professionals. Videos and manuals stated that concerns about addiction and overdose were, quote, inaccurate and exaggerated. Additionally, Purdue funded over 20,000 what they termed educational programs on pain, which were really thinly disguised sales seminars for the company's products. On the Commission's website, I decided to visit and see how they presented themselves. The organization disingenuously presents itself as an independent organization with a mission, quote, to continuously improve health care for the public. The Commission certifies over 22,000 healthcare organizations and programs in the, in the United States and issues what they call a gold seal of approval to qualifying institutions and states that its vision is for all people to experience the safest and best quality healthcare. This seems incredibly inconsistent with the organization's actions, which included partnership with Purdue, a, a criminal organization had already been convicted of criminal wrongdoing to expand the prescribing of opiate drugs. Now, the Joint Commission is a very powerful organization, and its standards dictate the way American hospitals and medical facilities are operated. It forced medical institutions and healthcare professionals to actively look for pain in patients and then to treat it with opiates. According to McGreal, the Joint Commission has recently changed its guidelines but denies any wrongdoing. And what I find incredulous, the Joint Commission states that doctors and the APS were to blame for the opiate crisis because they presented false evidence. Now this is interesting. How can this commission claim to offer a certification that has any meaning at all if it essentially believes any information presented to it without any further investigation? The APS disbanded in 2019, claiming it was the victim of a witch hunt. None of the groups or individuals involved in this debacle seem to have any intention of taking responsibility. And in an interesting twist, they try to present themselves as victim, as a victim and, and to claim that all the others did it, not them. They're all pointing the finger at the others. We were trying to do the right thing. It was them. Well, it was all of them, actually. And sometimes just taking responsibility is the right thing to do. The Federation of State Medical Boards is an interesting organization. It's a nonprofit that develops guidelines for 70 state medical boards in the United States and its territories, and it's also the co-sponsor of medical licensing examinations. The Federation took $100,000 from Purdue Pharma to help pay for the printing and distribution of a piece called Responsible Opioid Prescribing, a Physician's Guide. The Federation estimated that it would need $3 million to complete its marketing program to, compl uh, to promote the, um, what they called, safe use of opiate drugs for chronic pain. Six other opioid makers were asked to contribute to the campaign, and I was unable to track down how much of this money they collected, but um, I think it's interesting that the Federation of State Medical Boards takes money from drug companies, and then it tells the medical boards and the various states what to do. No wonder medical boards are taking away licenses or threatening to for doctors who buck the system, for example, on something like vaccines. Now the FDA, incredibly culpable, approving new opioid drugs while more and more Americans were dying as a result of taking them. Unfortunately, the agency is still doing this. It approved a drug called Desuvia this year, uh, earlier this year, which believe it or not, is a more potent version of fentanyl. It's hard to imagine that they would do this. 
Well, the decision, which is difficult to reconcile in view of the crisis, results from the fact that the FDA is funded primarily by the drug companies. Um, it's projected to collect $1.1 billion in user fees by the end of this year, 2019. Not surprisingly, the approval rate for drugs is 96%. Even though 70% of the operating budget of the FDA comes from these user fees, the FDA insists that this financial support does not influence its decisions in any way. Right. I mean, I, I don't know anybody who would believe that. I think probably uh, young children would be able to see through this. The American Medical Association, well, they're not exempt from liability either. They opposed a law introduced in Congress that would have required doctors to receive training in order to prescribe opiate drugs. Now, how they could be possibly opposed to this is just, it's beyond the pale. Members of Congress, funded by Big Pharma, helped the AMA to kill the bill with public attacks on sponsors and advocates. Congressman Butterfield, a Democrat from North Carolina, praised the drug distributors for their, quote, very impressive efforts to stop opioids from ending up in the hands of people who should not take them. The irony was that at the same time that this idiot was making this statement, the companies were paying fines to the Justice Department for failing to report suspicious orders from small rural pharmacies for millions of pills. I remember reading in McGreal's book that one pharmacy in a town of 400 people was ordering like 9 million pills a month. It was just absolutely ridiculous. I strongly recommend that you read Chris McGreal's book and the entire article from, with, from which I withdrew significant pieces of what I'm telling you here. I also, the research on the FDA and the, um, the lawsuit against the commission, that sort of thing, I did some supplemental research, but the article and the book are both pretty amazing. While speaking at our conference, Chris stated that really nothing's been learned from the experience and the same behavior continues with all of the players implicated here, the FDA, Congress, the Federation of State Medical Boards, the American Medical Association, the drug companies, the Joint Commission, and so on. You know, the medical profession, along with its government and nonprofit partners, has egregiously violated the public trust and committed heinous acts. And in my opinion, financial settlements are not enough. I mean, there should be criminal penalties for this. And these companies and organizations and these people should just not be able to pay a fine, which means nothing to them, and go back to their regular life. Unfortunately, it's highly unlikely that criminal prosecution of the people who are the masterminds of the scheme will take place. Consumers should remember this episode whenever interacting with anybody about any issue in the medical field. And that's why I said at the beginning that what happened here has broad implications for anybody interacting with healthcare. The whole system is corrupt and um, most people are not to be trusted. There are exceptions to the rule. There are some ethical doctors, ethical dietitians and nurses and people even in government who care and try to do the right thing. But the system as a whole is corrupted. And so, um, you know, you just the buyer should beware. And I never thought I would say this, but I think it is risk. I think the most risky thing that a person can do is interaction with the medical system. And to control the risk, you better be informed. That's our business. Let us help you with it. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you next week with more news.